Uh, hi everyone, this is Maris here once again, and uh, today I have an amazing guest. It's uh, Kirill Balkanov. He is the product lead of Chainstack, and uh, if you are a web freeze builder, you already know about the Chainstack and who he is. It's probably if you don't know, you have been living under the rock. Uh, he brings over a decade of experience across AI, data science, and software development. Uh, in the sectors like fintech, telecom, and automotive. Uh, he has also played a pivotal role on subgraph services uh, in the chain stack, and he has a lot of impact on drawing uh, an extensive background in system analysis from his PhD to tackle complex technology. Uh, Kirill, it's really good to have you here. Yeah, hello. Thank you for having me here. Amazing. So I will introduce a little bit of the topic today. Uh, very shortly, very briefly, uh, we're going to talk about how we can simplify building a web free. Uh, because of Kirill and uh, Chainstack experience, we are bringing a lot of interesting facts over here. Uh, we're going to talk about decentralized applications versus centralized application, about an infrastructure for these uh, two different species in the software development. We also going to talk about RPCs and blockchain interaction layer, how developers do connect, what are security challenges, what are scalability challenges, and uh, overall how to make a cost effective solution while you're developing. Because uh, eventually, when it comes to infrastructure, there are two most important pieces, it's security and optimization. Uh, the third thing we're going to talk about is uh, token API and standardization of token API and overall data collection from the blockchains. And the last thing, and we're going to touch it a little bit briefly because we don't want to uh, spend too much time on this, but it's clearly a really important topic if IPF, it's IPFS and decentralized storage. Uh, so maybe to our listeners, you can uh, shortly introduce uh, what differentiates Web2 app and Web3 app? And I know because we have uh, some of the users are very technical, but we have uh, also listeners who are very new to Web3 and they might be developers who are just starting their career. Uh, so I think for them, it's really important to understand the basics, you know, like what differentiates and then we're going to dive deeper. So Mike, yours. Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, basically, uh, Web 2 development and Web 3 development uh, are uh, pretty similar in some ways, but uh, there are uh, a few things that uh, really differs uh, them. Um, first of all, uh, I guess uh, any Web 2 application with uh, all the software development, uh, product management, uh, security uh, questions, uh, everything is uh, can be applied to Web3 development, uh, because uh, every time you have a back-end server, front-end server, front-end application, or uh, mobile application, or in even desktop application, and so on, you have uh, databases on the back-end, virtual private servers, or dedicated servers, and so on. Uh, but uh, besides that, uh, uh, for a Web3 application, you also have uh, a big different thing. You have to uh, communicate with the blockchain. And uh, uh, assuming that the blockchain is uh, the decentralized network with a lot of uh, peers uh, or miners uh, or val validators, depending on the particular network, uh, we have a structure that is, uh, in most cases, it's uh, you can control it, you can just connect to it, you can try to to play just in their uh, rules that it has, and uh, you have to uh, like you can only accept these rules, and you can also you have also to accept uh, the. Uh, uh, security, uh, potential threats, uh, problems, and so on. And uh, uh, how the uh, uh, developers uh, has been communicated uh, had been communicated uh, with the blockchain before. Uh, like the main thing, the main uh, uh, method is to run their own node, uh, which is uh, the specific software uh, which uh, support the consensus mechanism of the. Uh, 
uh, network uh, and uh, uh, you have to maintain it, you have to uh, update it, you have to uh, face with uh, the failure because uh, usually the blockchain nodes, uh, node clients, uh, the software which is open sourced, which is maintained by the community and not always uh, uh, like 100% uh, uh, stable and secure. So you have to do a lot of uh, work, which is uh, I, like looks inevitable to for a Web3 application. Uh, just to start uh, like being or working on a Web3 application. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the uh, product that we are working on and uh, our competitors, and there is a kind of consensus in this industry that uh, there are uh, Web3 infrastructure providers, uh, actually node providers, uh, who are running uh, these uh, nodes uh, uh, instead of uh, the Web3 builders. And Web3 builders can focus on their uh, own, uh, their particular interests uh, that they're doing, they're developing the application, they're not uh, maintaining the infrastructure, instead they're developing their smart contracts, so they're developing their front-end and back-end, which is communicating with the blockchain, they're... Um, they're actually living on the next uh, layer of the abstraction in this scale. So they don't have a think about uh, the blockchain consensus mechanism and uh, how the nodes are operating, how they're communicating, uh, how they're uh, actually exceeding every time exceeding the amount of resources uh, provided for them, how they're failing, how, and how to repair all this stuff. Yeah, that's uh, the main difference uh, uh, between Web two and Web three. Yeah, it's uh, for for the listeners who don't know, but uh, Sacro Labs, uh, which I'm representing, and I will be advocating the developers uh, because I'm bringing like over six years of uh, solidity and Web three development experience over here. So I will be advocating all from one side and probably you will be advocating from the chain stack side, which is an infrastructure, which is very interesting combination because there is not that much information on the internet, like podcast and communication about these topics, about security risks. Uh, so maybe for the listeners who are a bit newer to these concepts, uh, I will explain what are the potential risks. And uh, we are using chain stack service for our token API, for our NFT data tracking API, and uh, uh, if you are running your own node, it can be quite complex. Why? Because blockchain is a consensus mechanism, which is fully decentralized. So your node and your infrastructure has to ensure that it always keeps up with the network and it's stable and localized. So uh, as you know, even though the internet is pretty much speed of light, we still have a limitations of the networking because the world is a big place and there are routers, etc. So even let's say someone in Asia submits a transaction to the blockchains because of the way internet is designed due to latent latencies and due to consensus mechanism on another side of the world, uh, the other node might not know about that transaction. And uh, these nodes has to eventually come to the agreement that data is valid. Uh, so if you are pulling data from the blockchain, uh, you need to make sure that your node have a latest data. And uh, this is an interesting thing. Let's say you are running the exchange or you are doing some uh, partially decentralized actions. Let's say you are tracking um, you are tracking the RPC on the one side, so you're tracking the blockchain data on the one side or on the one blockchain, let's say you're tracking data on uh, the polygon and you want to do some action on the Sacro blockchain, for example, even for bridges, you need to make sure that the data you're getting on Polygon is legit and up to date to make decisions on another blockchain because there is no like direct communication because bridging works with the smart contracts on a different size and then syncs through the centralized service. Uh, so it comes with the challenges. So if we look to the normal Web2 infrastructure, um, a lot of like small startups and a lot of medium-sized startups, they don't have enough uh, resources uh, to hire a dedicated DevOps because DevOps is expensive service and uh, you know, like they do the service configuration. So a lot of people eventually fall back to services like Heroku. You know, like in Heroku, you can literally 
deploy and have the very well maintained uh, application and service with a very limited DevOps knowledge. Because like Heroku is a layer on top of AVS. So I think as a chain stack, you represent literally this in the web free. You're presenting the layer of infrastructure, which helps developers to reduce the headache and just uh, have the always accessible, always secure, and always uh, really fast access to the blockchain data. Yes, uh, it is true, and uh, this is a pretty good analogy uh, with uh, Heroku. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, there, there are some differences uh, because uh, with uh, Heroku or any other uh, similar services, uh, uh, the customer is basically still um, uh, deploy the application, uh, which is different than like some other customer deploys to the same service. So they have uh, to um, maintain the service in the way when uh, the customers, every customer is different and they don't know what they launch. Uh, in our case, uh, we are uh, basically uh, running the same software and uh, uh, like the same blockchain client, for instance, for uh, Ethereum, it, there can be a, a few different clients, but uh, the software is the same, uh, which actually uh, looks uh, uh, as a similar, um, easier task uh, compared to these hosting uh, services. Uh, but, uh, but actually it, it doesn't work this way because uh, this uh, software, is much less stable compared to anything related to just, uh, for instance, Linux uh, or Kubernetes uh, or so on. And uh, this, um, especially uh, the things related to the consensus mechanism and the mining or validating the new blocks, uh, which are appearing, can appear in any part of the world and um, uh, the uh, networks, uh, ha the clients has a tendency to just uh, stop on some block and uh, you, every time you have to check if there is a new block in the network which hasn't been, so for some reason, hasn't been acquired by your particular node and um, uh, the uh, networks can go to forking and you can have uh, you can um, get into one fork which is not uh, the major and uh, uh, every time uh, it looks like pretty uh, pretty easy thing and we know that uh, uh, like there there is a, um, a big group of uh, developers who are running their own nodes and uh, they can um, even master this, uh, uh, like I would say, uh, art uh, of running nodes uh, uh, for a uh, network. Uh, and then when they face uh, with the uh, need or with the uh, desire to run their software on, for instance, uh, uh, several new uh, EVM compatible, for instance, uh, uh, blockchains, they uh, figure out that uh, pretty the same client uh, on the other network works uh, extremely different way. And uh, there are a lot of new uh, errors, failures uh, that uh, you have to face. And uh, this idea that uh, you can um, easily scale your application for several networks it doesn't actually work well, even from this point that you can't run the same, uh, like, pretty the same client and know their uh, pain points uh, and deploy the same uh, contract. Of course, there is a problem related to the contract that you don't have the same contracts on some other network and so on. But uh, the idea that you can scale easily, uh, it, it is really attractive. And with uh, uh, this uh, layer of uh, infrastructure providers, uh, it can come true, at least in this part, that you don't have to think about this infrastructure, that it's different, how it fails. And so just uh, uh, open this uh, mm, platform and get access to all of them. And you again, you can focus on your uh, interest you know, on developing a Web3 application itself. And uh, I think it's uh, really good and it uh, really uh, refers to our topic of the discussion. It was actually really helpful to us because we needed to launch, uh, I think right now we support around 12 EV different EVMs. 
Uh, I've built a like an original service uh, for our token and data tracking API, uh, but I'm currently not actually actively engaged in that part. We have a dedicated team who grew un, uh, under my management, and you know, like right now, they're doing a very well job. Actually, even found like one my mistake. I'm not like a robot as well, which managed to improve performance. Uh, I think by around seventy percent per request. So we are. Uh, not sorry, not per request, but uh, but per block. Like we are right now, we are managed to. I think right now the average uh, block consumption time is around like one and a half second. So immediately when we receive from the web socket uh, the block, in a one and a half second, we know everything what what is happening there, despite the size, despite how many transactions and NFTs, etc. So I think that's like especially very useful for products who wants to have like a real time updates. Uh, you're also supporting uh, Solana and you're also supporting non-EVM services. Maybe you can tell a little bit uh, of the difference in the journey because I'm really interested in, interested how these non-EVM blockchains, because they are so separated from the whole ecosystem, you know, like developers need to learn specific language, they have totally different stack, etc. How implementation of Solana service, like, it, was it a big headache or because it also has totally different node uh, for those who don't know, because I just recently work on a uh, Solana parser, for example, so normal Solana nodes that not, does not support uh, full history. So you have to have a literally a totally differently customized node if you want to access historical data. So, uh, Kirill, maybe you can uh, just literally share a little bit, not not overextend because we don't have this in a topic, but I remembered it and I wanted to talk a little bit for a second. Uh, yeah, Solana uh, and other non-EVM compatible nodes uh, actually is a, a big headache for us uh, because... Uh, like for, for anybody, I guess, uh, because you, you get used to some approach, uh, to some like uh, good decisions, good solutions, you, you have them uh, and you are uh, trying to work with this uh, per new particular blockchain and you see that nobody, no, nothing works and uh, it fails uh, in, in way different, uh, like, uh, uh, like pretty different. And uh, uh, also it ca consumes much more computational resources and um, um, like I, I, uh, I, I even uh, know people who um, are working with Solana, and then, like they end up like stop working at all uh, with the blockchain nodes. Uh, but uh, uh, the Solana is uh, really challenging, and uh, we have, uh, I guess, uh, two years of experience with Solana. Uh, and I would say that um, uh, it uh, uh, like we we did a lot of uh, stuff, and uh, I guess uh, one of the most uh, um, important thing was to go to bare metal service servers, and uh, uh, that they um, it's much more challenging to run software on bare metal servers, but uh, finally you get uh, uh, great outcomes uh, because when you uh, when, when you figure out how to do it on them, then you, you can offer a really decent service. Uh, and uh, yes, Solana, um, Solana Ledger, uh, even full, for full node, is so huge uh, that uh, it's uh, impossible just to run it in archive no mode and uh, have all the data accessible and uh, uh, all, all that we see is that uh, some like you can extend that uh, the number of blocks which are accessible for uh, Solana API and uh, like basically uh, this is the main thing that uh, uh, we can do but uh, and uh, also like thinking about uh, the uh, speed of uh, increasing the speed of growth of the ledger uh, I think there uh, in the future we'll see some uh, particular uh, like new approach uh, on how to host uh, how to maintain these Solana nodes uh, because uh, now uh, it looks like uh, a really good alternative uh, to EVM in terms of uh, um, different things like in terms of speed of transactions or in terms of accessible uh, accessing to the states of the tokens and so on for instance for like 
uh, you don't even need uh, uh, an NFT API or balance API for Solana, which is a different uh, part of like, you know, or like it is a separate part, uh, uh, which is not included into, for instance, your M compatible chains, but on Solana you have it uh, like right away. You, you can get, um, you can develop uh, much more con- in much more convenient way. Uh, it's not even uh, mentioning that uh, you don't have to write Solidity code. You can uh, use Rust and uh, Rust. Uh, I-, I guess for almost five years, one of top uh, um, languages that uh, developers will just love to use, uh, even not having the opportunity to use it uh, on their job. Uh, they are using it for their pet projects. Uh, and uh, voting uh, on GitHub uh, showing that uh, we love this uh, uh, language. And uh, Solana is kind of, uh, to, to me, it looks like uh, they say, like, uh, you had this, you had that about uh, um, Web3 programming, smart contracts, and we will do it uh, in the other way around. Uh, uh, so you will love this. <laughs> but from the... Uh, from the um, Web3 infrastructure provider side, it, it, it's a nightmare. Uh, I just steal. Uh, and, uh, but we, we continue investing in Solana, and uh, we think that uh, this is like they have a great future with uh, all their uh, ideas, uh, approach, uh, and uh, the out- all, already uh, uh, that outcomes and ecosystem that they're building. Actually, when I've, uh, I remember my first time I've parsed the data from like Solana blockchain. And I think that block has had like, I think 2000 transactions because every block also contains the information of every uh, reward, which is distributed during the uh, block confirmation. So I think that part is a little bit overhead when it comes to uh, the data because you get, let's say block contained like, probably 20 asset transactions or something like that. But you get this like huge network overload with kind of for the developer necessary data. So uh, it might be that that can be uh, updating the, our, like their uh, node service uh, to, su- to support more developer friendly nodes. So let's say you could switch between different nodes, the one uh, for the people, for example, for like uh, confirmators who wants to track like who receives reward and what. And another is like more for developers. So the data which actually contains only the um, smart contract data. Uh, though I do totally agree with you that the Rust and uh, is, uh, has been, has like, is becoming really hot. I remember like even a few years ago, uh, I was talking with uh, Ilya, the Nier CEO, and like we were like all in on Rust. We be like Nier and like Solana, they we are kind of similar in in the way we approached uh, the different building. We dif- like di- we approach differently the web pre, uh, and it's it's interesting how you go. Though I will not uh, skip the opportunity to market our product. And I can tell that uh, Sakura blockchain has the faster confirmation time right now than Solana. So we have uh, 300 milliseconds because we are using OP stack uh, produced by uh, Oasis. And uh, that allows us to pretty much have fully on-chain games real time with no gas fees. So just just letting people know. <laughs> so uh, as a chain stack representative, maybe you can explain to people the difference also between a public node and uh, and the purpose of the public nodes and the public RPCs versus private RPCs and a, uh, private nodes because they definitely uh, have a different purpose uh, and uh, there are some specific scenarios where people should definitely use private nodes especially if you are you know like using it for a uh, for example, trading, like recently I've read on Reddit about one case uh, because the guy was using uh, a sushi swap and he left a way too high slippage. I think it was around 10%. Uh, there was a bot who identified this in the public mempool and uh, he basically manipulated the sushi swap in a way that guy lost like $2 million or $3 million because he manipulated the price pumped up the price, had a slippage, and then sold back. And the guy lost 
incredible amount of money and that would probably never happen if he would be using the private uh, private blockchain so maybe you can uh, explain the differences to the listeners and then we can discuss the like, cons and pros uh, the uh, uh, public uh, nodes are uh, like essential part of uh, uh, the uh, decentralization itself uh, and uh, like you uh, uh, Assuming that uh, uh, the blockchain is uh, a permissionless uh, environment, you anybody can run their own nodes. Uh, but um, uh, usually, uh, the teams uh, who are maintaining uh, the development of uh, this or that uh, blockchain are interested uh, to have uh, uh, the public endpoints to lower the the barrier for new developers uh, who can uh, start developing on their uh, network. So it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, at the moment, it's uh, uh, kind of a must for a uh, blockchain, for a team who are maintaining it to have some public uh, endpoints uh, and uh, um, uh, to allow users um, d- to develop, uh, to start development, uh, just use uh, this endpoint, and also for uh, investors who can uh, add their endpoint to their wallet and to send the transactions or see their balances. Uh, but um, when it comes to the uh, process of uh, real development of the web application that we are speaking about, uh, uh, the developers uh, face with uh, that uh, nothing is um, has uh, an infinite capacity, and uh, when uh, the uh, when a uh, particular endpoint uh, is publicly available, you cannot rely on it uh, on your production application uh, as well as um, in some cases in the development uh, during the development process because uh, for instance if um, some uh, users are heavily using this particular endpoint even if uh, the uh, maintainer of uh, this endpoint uh, uh, made all everything they need to uh, protect this endpoint from abuse. It's uh, you can not uh, be protected from that uh, periods when there are a lot of uh, um, users are doing sending their transactions through this endpoint or looking at their balances while during uh, the. Uh, uh, for instance, airdrops or some other promotions. So there are uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, reasons uh, uh, why uh, you can just rely on some public endpoints in your production uh, application. And this is the main, um, uh, to me, it's uh, the main use case. When you have an application and you want to, to you want this application to work well for your customers, uh, uh, you have to have uh, your uh, dedicated infrastructure. Uh, in these terms, I'm saying dedicated. I don't. I don't mean that uh, it has to be in a separate uh, uh, like computing units uh, or so on. But you, you don't have to be uh, publicly available for everybody. Uh, and um, uh, the the main difference is that. Uh, uh, when you are using um, uh, some paid service, even on the uh, free plan, you have access to the infrastructure where the provider is uh, thinking about your uh, particular uh, consumption and is trying to ensure that uh, nobody will influence your particular application while it is uh, uh, using uh, this uh, particular uh, endpoint. Uh, speaking about uh, the uh, privacy, I wouldn't say that in particular this uh, uh, case with uh, <clears throat> uh, Mempool uh, is uh, the main um, thing because uh, the mempool data is actually uh, it's not hidden it's uh, like the nodes are uh, exchanging this data uh, just because uh, the uh, uh, miners or validators need to get ex- need to have access to all these transactions to be able to include them into the blocks uh, and uh, this particular case can be um, uh, 
like they uh, protected from, for instance, from sandwich bots or uh, some other things uh, via private pools of validators. Uh, uh, this is also possible, but it's kind of different uh, use case in, in these terms. Okay, for us actually uh, using uh, chain stack services, one of the reasons was uh, rate limiting. So I don't know, like I will just explain it for our listeners. So uh, let's say if you have a public node, like because every request takes uh, puts a load on a server, uh, on a network and on a networking. Uh, so there is literally very logical thing to just prevent people to calling it unlimited time. So let's say if you have a block and if you're trying to parse the data from that block and when you try to get access from the token data, you're probably doing from 200 to 20,000 requests, uh, you know, like per few minutes. Uh, imagine like right now the developers comes and start DDoSing, you know, like uh, you're starting to doing like millions of requests. So definitely there has to be protection from that. Uh, so public RPCs usually have uh, rate limiting uh, and then you need to parse like large data, when you need to do a lot of requests to the blockchain, you need to have pretty much unlimited or at least customized accessibility to uh, the blockchain. Definitely very reliability, again, public blockchain, like public RPCs uh, endpoints are usually way more unstable uh, when it comes to private ones, because also the private ones, companies like Chainstack, who is interested to uh, provide the high quality services, they definitely have their internal secret and perfect scenarios, how to optimize and make those uh, services stable. And when it comes from like our perspective, the cost and maintenance of each different node, um, as always, I am pro of everyone doing their own job. So if you are a web free developer and you are building, for example, blockchain layer infrastructure, token API, or whatever solution, decentralized swapping, you should be focusing on uh, doing what you do best uh, and uh, not going into the details. So let's say managing infrastructure. Uh, the other interesting thing, because blockchain products are evolving right now, uh, I think we are at the stage where a lot of companies are trying to make uh, things way more user-friendly. And the user friendliness because of the way the blockchain data is structured, and this is actually transitioning to our next topic about uh, indexing. Uh, the blockchain data is not normal database. You know, like in the database, if you're using SQL or no SQL database, you can just in the like you few clicks or few commands apply the indexing and let's say index your whole database based on specific parameter. But because of the way blockchain is structured and the, all the data is not consistent, uh, you are not you're not dedicating specific spaces for different data. Everything is literally in one pool. Uh, that causes the need to aggregate the data, do a lot of requests and do the indexes. So this is a two layer process. And I think this is where you are really an expert. Uh, so can you tell a little bit more about indexing, about the graphs and about the challenges from the infrastructure? And then I can extend on a token API and then we can absolutely smoothly transition to the, uh, to the next topic as well. If you don't mind, I would uh, rather start uh, from the, uh, like uh, slightly uh, continuing uh, the previous topic. Uh, um, we, uh, uh, as an infrastructure provider, uh, and it is applica uh, applicable also can be applied to the indexing service or to the RPC nodes. Uh, we always think about uh, the standardization uh, because uh, without uh, the standardization, uh, we can come up with some service which uh, helps to developers. And in that case, they will be uh, uh, they will get into the vendor lock with us and they will not be able to switch to another provider. Uh, to us, it could be a like, good um, condition to like have this customer, but actually nobody wins because uh, this customer will finally figure out that uh, it's not, uh, um, they, if 
they have any issues with us, they will not be able to switch to another provider. And the whole idea of decentralization like fails. Uh, they just uh, uh, continue working on some proprietary thing, which is uh, not actually decentralized. Transferring from the topic of nodes, uh, I would just uh, also say that um, when we are developing a solution, uh, we are trying to make it uh, interchangeable. You, you can, uh, working with uh, Chainstack nodes, uh, you can still switch to some other nodes, even to public nodes for your, for instance, uh, customers who will add this node inst- instead of uh, uh, Chainstack node to be able to, to ensure that it's a completely decentralized solution. And uh, for instance, when we um, develop uh, our nodes, we also add uh, a layer of uh, uh, global load balancing, for instance, when you uh, your customer or you making a request from one point of uh, um, Earth and uh, they always uh, request to go to the closest uh, node. Uh, and also when you need archival data or full data, you can be, uh, your request will be redirected to the node which has the uh, lowest latency. Uh, and uh, uh, so underneath, there are not just nodes, but there is uh, uh, something that uh, has been invented to make your experience uh, perfect. And, uh, uh, but uh, you always uh, have to uh, understand and be sure that the interface is the same. You can always try to check that it works exactly the way uh, the other node works. Another provider or your own self-hosted node or any public uh, uh, API public uh, endpoints uh, that we discussed before. Uh, so uh, with the indexing, uh, we had um, uh, the uh, pretty similar type of a problem. We would like to uh, do some uh, product that uh, help customers with uh, this indexing problem, but we had also to think about uh, the standardization. We In our vision, we can't uh, develop something proprietary which will lock the customer in our platform because it's uh, um, it's uh, um, the it fails the idea of decentralization. And um, uh, to describe the problem of indexing, uh, uh, I I would uh, start with an example. For instance, uh, um, if you are developing uh, a, a decentralized uh, exchange, for instance, uh, what what you do? Uh, you uh, develop smart contracts, you deploy them uh, onto the blockchain, and uh, uh, your customers are making the transactions, and uh, these transactions are pro- being processed by the blockchain, and then they are um, uh, getting into the... Uh, mess actually the mess of all the transactions of all uh, smart contracts of all applications not even exchange and uh, just to get uh, just to um, allow customers uh, just to help customers to see their particular balance of your tokens on their uh, account or to see their swaps history uh, to like the simple uh, the simple tasks that in Web2 uh, are being solved by uh, the databases uh, with one SQL uh, query uh, becomes uh, the nightmare for blockchain. It's impossible to do it uh, via RPC uh, API uh, or like any other type of APIs that um, are uh, available for the nodes. And you have to do some extra work, which is uh, usually uh, not uh, so uh, straightforward uh, at all. Uh, because, uh, for instance, um, if you, you would like to show your customers the history of their transactions, uh, you have to do uh, the long list of uh, uh, tasks. Uh, first, you have to create a uh, database that you will use uh, to uh, store the transactions of your customers. 
then uh, to find, uh, for instance, uh, the transactions the transactions ha- that has been processed, uh, uh, you have to go through the entire blockchain, uh, fi- looking for the transactions of your particular smart contract, uh, then store them into your database. Like you have to decode it, of course, uh, using KBI files and so on. Then store them into your database. And uh, it will take a lot of time. Actually, you have to have an archival node. This archival node has to be pretty fast to, to um, allow you to go through the entire blockchain, through the, all the transactions. Then you have to maintain a service which will uh, get every new block that has appeared in the network and uh, process it in the same way and to put them into the database. And then the most interesting thing, when the um, network has a fork, you have to process this fork because uh, uh, you just, uh, for instance, you have saved the last transaction, which has been in the um, uh, fork in the part of uh, in the branch that has been rejected. You have to uh, do, uh, you have to go to the previous stage. You have to process it once again. You have to update your UI of your customer who is looking into the wrong balances and so on. So there is a lot of uh, things to do just to uh, do this uh, simple thing with the blockchain. Uh, And uh, if um, we are thinking about uh, the blockchain as a decentralized uh, database, uh, it's uh, not uh, so true because it's uh, kind of the decentralized uh, a database that uh, don't want you to uh, find uh, that you need actually, uh, and in this case, uh, we see the like big opportunity that we can help uh, developers to uh, find the data that they need to have it, uh, this data uh, in up to date. Uh, always up to date via API, but uh, any uh, solution that we could um, develop uh, would be uh, a proprietary. And we don't want uh, to have these type of solutions. Uh, and uh, uh, what we uh, did is actually uh, we are big fans of uh, the graph uh, and the graph uh, decentralized network is uh, uh, the beautiful idea and beautiful project that uh, uh, is uh, well known in the community and um, this uh, the idea of this uh, network is uh, to make all the data on the blockchain accessible for anybody uh, in a permissionless way uh, also, and um, they also had an indexing uh, uh, software, uh, which uh, is being run by uh, all the indexers uh, in the network, uh, that allows uh, developers to do the uh, following thing. Uh, if you know what contract uh, contracts uh, you would like to uh, index, and uh, you understand how they are arranged inside, like you, they have events or they have uh, function calls and they have uh, some outputs, uh, you can write pretty straightforward uh, f- like few lines of code uh, in a specific programming language uh, uh, similar to TypeScript. Uh, you can run this on a indexing node. You don't need to think uh, how it works, how it is uh, built inside. You just uh, run these uh, few lines of code on this node and it uh, does like the, all, all the job you need. It uh, goes through the entire blockchain. It collects all the data from the blockchain into the specific database. It, uh, all, uh, it processes uh, new transactions, new blocks, and it even uh, uh, works uh, with uh, these uh, rare chain reorganization. So you, you actually don't need to think about all this stuff. And in the end, you have a GraphQL interface. Uh, which has, which even has uh, the user interf- graphical user interface with uh, the schemas, and uh, you write simple GraphQL code and get the data always up to date with uh, the uh, all the depths of uh, this data, right from the first block where uh, when the contract has been deployed, and it is uh, like it it, it looks uh, brilliant uh, as a, an idea. Uh, but uh, 
and it's open source. You can uh, always run your own graph node. You can even run it uh, uh, beside, like not inside of the network. Uh, and uh, the problem is uh, that when you start doing it, you face with uh, also a few challenges. Um, like the main challenge, I would say that uh, uh, not even the price because uh, the uh, archive nodes uh, that are being used by the graph uh, uh, has to, like you, you have to do a lot of uh, queries uh, to the archive nodes uh, uh, and uh, it costs some money. Also archive nodes are the nodes that uh, um, like uh, has a big ledger uh, and uh, the price uh, for requests are uh, more expensive than to full nodes. And uh, uh, but the main thing is that it's not actually uh, so um, reliable. When you run um, the graph, the graph node, uh, like for, I would say that uh, first uh, six months of uh, running the graph node, uh, uh, we were not ready to do well uh, to um, uh, ship a reliable product. That we see that uh, the idea is still beautiful but it doesn't work the way that we want we, we can't uh, uh, say that um, we can't offer it to our customers and uh, there has in our on our side um, we did a few um, big uh, improvements uh, from the infrastructure mostly side from the node side and so on to make this more reliable and also some fallbacks and so on and uh, when we uh, were ready, when we uh, figured out that it uh, is good enough, then we uh, made this service service um, uh, available for the customers uh, on the uh, also on the um, paid basis. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of customers who were um, uh, happy to uh, start using it because uh, the main alternative. Um, for them was to use the decentralized network, uh, but um, I would say uh, the uh, that the decentralized network is uh, the great uh, idea and it has a great future because uh, all the data needs to be dis- uh, available in the decentralized way, in permissionless way. Uh, but uh, also there are use cases uh, which. Um, don't need the decentralization, but they need the data. And the difference is that when you have the decentralization, you have to pay for it. You have to pay for the consensus. You have you you have to pay in tokens uh, also. But uh, I mean that there is an overhead which is pretty significant that uh, you just can't uh, take uh, your uh, subgraph code, deploy it somewhere. You, you don't have this uh, place and uh, pay for it in, in like using your credit card and don't think about uh, uh, all this decentralization and blockchain stuff because you are focused on your uh, particular thing. You are developing this index and you have to get this data. You have to show it to your customers. In, in some parts, you, you just don't need the decentralization, but you still don't want to be locked in some vendor. Uh, and uh, with using the open standard of the graph, uh, I hope that we achieve this because uh, we are offering the service where you can deploy your own uh, subgraph, which is the, these few lines of code that I mentioned before, uh, and you have this API. But anytime you need to uh, get back to the de- decentralized environment, uh, you, if you have this uh, uh, particular requirement the, here or there, you can get the same code that you has been developed and you, you used it on Chainstack and you can go to the graph decentralized network, you can deploy it there. Uh, you have to uh, follow the rules, you have to use these tokens, uh, their tokens, you have to pay for fees, you have to pay to incentivize indexers to index your code and so on. You have to do a lot of stuff, but you still can use all your uh, outcomes or your results of your development uh, using our friendly uh, environment. And you can transfer to the full decentralization, true decentralization. 
which is, in my opinion, it's, it's really a great uh, idea and a great result. Mm, interesting. Uh, I have been like experimenting with the graph nodes like very, very briefly. So the question is, do we solve, uh, so let's say custom, custom interactions like custom events, parsings, like how does, how does it work regarding that? Like, because part of the way where we designed our solution, like type token API and like data, uh, we are parsing the data like in a more centralized way, definitely doing all these requests, but that's why we're using Chainstack for. Uh, but at the same time, we enable the capability to make data uh, developer friendly. So what I think it's really important is that part where data is converted to from all the hashes and all the low level data on the blockchain to the human readable data, you know, like which can consume, can be consumed by any developer. So the question is, does, is it possible to reach that level of developer friendliness? So let's say any mm, non blockchain developer can come in and just immediately start developing, like not getting the hashes, but getting that, you know, like what he wants to see, like balances and et cetera. I would say, uh, I wouldn't say yes. And uh, if, to my point, from my point of view, it's not a, a disadvantage. It's uh, rather the uh, different levels of uh, um, the uh, not even developers. It's different know. applicability. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like we are talking about like to be like the same way we are talking about like a crypto users who you know, it has a hardware wallet and has several layers of security. And when we have like on the other side, we have uh, like quest to earn campaign hunters, you know, like who probably has like much less uh, overview on like different coins. So the same is developers. There are people who are just want to build something fun on blockchain. What is it? like maybe a little bit, maybe more decentralized, maybe completely decentralized. And there are hard code like blockchain developers who are, you know, like chatting on Reddit and like private EG groups about like hardcore stuff and, and, and they are diving deep. So I think what you're talking is like these, uh, like solving a bit different issues, but I was just really curious about, um, like, is it possible to either add a layer on top and is it possible to uh, unify that? Because the graph has a very, does a very good job on indexing. The problem I see then, because we are communicating with quite a few developers, is indexing is one part and definitely ac accessing the log of the data and being able to query it like very easily and very fast has definitely been a headache and a headache to us. We have been approaching it a little bit differently, but I, I will not disclose this is, is like still a private secret of how we make it cheaper to index everything. But we wanted to have all the data in really user-friendly way. Uh, a lot of developers are um, who are coming to us, they are building like, they are not a hardcore web pre-developers. So we are trying to save as much time as possible because let's say you're running a small startup, you know, like you raised, let's say 500,000 and you have a developers, different developers in Asia, et cetera, et cetera. Like 500,000 for a lot of people can seem like a big amount of money, but actually when you need to run like a, a full team, do business development, do infrastructure development, do all these things, like it burns out pretty quickly. So the, the things what you're trying to do is like you're trying to minimize uh, your development cost. And, and let's say you want to launch whatever smart contract, like maybe DeFi, maybe gamification, maybe it's like some loyalty program for whatever, because we are working on like trying to bridge more like normal businesses to web from Web2 to Web3. Uh, and what you want to do is to track events. So let's say you need to see uh, people interactions and the best way to do this is to track events of the smart contracts. And maybe you are going away from the standardized ERC-1155 tokens or ERC-71 tokens, etc., And you're coming up with your own logic. Yes. Let's say it's some sort of game and it has like internal economy totally separated from the tokens. Let's say stats, levels, whatever. Uh, and you want to track then your um, game characters level up when they do different things. So you need an ability to track 
totally different type of data. Uh, so, and then we come really handy because we have an ability to just take your ABI, put it into our system, uh, run the indexer, and it takes all the already aggregated data, all the transactions, and you already have the full log and you already have the real time parsing. So this part, and you get it, get it in the way that like literally your name of your parameter and the value in a Huber readable format. No more hexes, no more anything. We just literally parse it based on your ABI. So this is a part we are focusing. And I think we are, this is interesting because after I, I've read, uh, I read about the subgraphs and about the indexing one for Chase Stack, I thought that we are tackling kind of a similar problem. But right now I see that the problem is a little bit, um, a little bit different. Uh, so interesting twist. There are um, several types of uh, the users, um, like uh, the developers or not even not developers, who need uh, this uh, data from the blockchain, from particularly from some decentralized applications. And um, what subgraphs is is uh, that uh, the low level service, low level like platform hosting that uh, highly qualified developers um, who can who understand what solidity is, what smart contract code is, and so on, uh, they can leverage this platform. Uh, and this is a really flexible um, way to get access to this data. For instance, if uh, you have um, like self-written smart contract which is not standard, as you said, which is not standardized, uh, but it still follows the rules of solidity and the ideas of uh, uh, emitting the events to uh, the logs or even not having these events, but uh, you can, tr you can, like you want just to uh, grab the event when the call function, function call just called and you want to, catch this event. Uh, in that case, you get the framework and the production environment, which allows you to do everything pretty easily and in a standardized way. Uh, but uh, you mentioned the uh, particular case when um, you have an ABI of uh, a smart contract and you want uh, to uh, get access to all the events and uh, even like some data maybe in, in from inside of uh, not these events but uh, from the function like some um, extra information regarding for instance transaction transaction hash and so on uh, attached to these uh, events uh, this is also possible use, uh, doing with subgraphs in also in automatic way and there is no uh, actually there is no competition between these because it's uh, just uh, uh, like kind of uh, dumb way to use subgraphs for this particular thing because uh, uh, like all, all the subgraphs do while you are generating your project, uh, like empty project, they do exactly this thing. Uh, you attach the ABI and it creates the code which will uh, collect all the events from the smart contract. And that's it. It's just default uh, behavior. But then you are opening this code and you are writing some extra code for instance, uh, I want to get also these uh, things from transaction. Also, I can uh, call another smart contract uh, from this uh, event. Its event has emitted, and then I go to another smart contract and extract the data from it, and also I store it to the database in a specific way. I can uh, combine the data from one contract and another. I can go to this database even while I got this event to extract some data from previous transactions and so on. And it's, it's really f flexible uh, framework uh, and the production environment for it. Uh, and like, this is the idea. And, uh, there is a, a several, several, like, there is a second layer, uh, also, uh, which also available with the graph. When you, uh, don't have, uh, I, I guess uh, you may even have no knowledge uh, regarding, uh, solidity development in particular. Uh, but you want to, you want access to this uh, data of some particular, for instance, uh, decentralized net, uh, decentralized exchange, for instance, the Uniswap. And uh, you would like to get uh, swaps 
from Uniswap with some particular uh, complex data related to accounts of uh, uh, these uh, guys who swapped and, or their balances are so on. And there is a, a, a se several layer uh, of uh, how we can use uh, the graph. So uh, w what I said before, it was uh, like the hosting for subgraphs. Yes, you, you write your subgraph, you deploy it to Chainstack, and you get this API, GraphQL API, to your smart contract. Uh, but also there are community subgraphs uh, for uh, popular protocols like Uniswap, SushiSwap and so on, there are uh, already written by uh, the community members or so by developers of these protocols uh, subgraphs code, which is available, which is uh, somehow, um, I would say, the community uh, agreed that uh, these subgraphs should be used if you would like to access this part the data of this particular protocol. And we take this subgraph, we run it on our site, and we just uh, allow users of Chainstack to access these uh, ready-to-use subgraphs uh, using GraphQL interface. And in that case, they uh, get access to all this flexible uh, style of uh, querying the data with uh, like a huge schema, for instance, for Uniswap or for SushiSwap, it's huge schema with uh, not only transactions or swaps, but some specific data regarding accounts or ticks of uh, uh, like aggregates of this data. And they are uh, in a mode, I would say, these guys uh, who will be used it this way, they're in mode of heavy analysts who can access to anything from inside of this uh, particular application, but they don't need to know how to program these uh, subgraphs, uh, how actually uh, the data is arranged inside of the smart contract, uh, but they have to uh, look at these schemas and figure out how it's uh, arranged uh, on the side of uh, the um, GraphQL and this uh, collected database, uh, the, this index data. And they have uh, like a, a really powerful way to uh, analyze data or to get new transactions also in their analytical way or in their production application. Because if they would uh, like to use it in this way, they also have the way how to make this uh, fully decentralized, uh, like you can take this subgraph, it's community-based, it's available, it's open source, you deploy it into uh, the graph network, or even you use a, a ready-to-use subgraph on the graph network, uh, you do all this um, uh, needed decentralized stuff, and uh, uh, you get everything um, uh, ready in the decentralized way. But this is a second level, of how to use uh, uh, the graph uh, and subgraphs uh, on Chainstack, for instance, uh, when you just uh, need to have, you just need to have to know, you have to know how to use GraphQL interface, and uh, uh, like you can use data of popular smart contracts. You still live and learn. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you. That was actually really, really new to me on some of the aspects. So it was really, really interesting to listen. Uh, let's overview uh, the importance of security. Uh, I would like to switch the topic a little bit and overview the um, importance of security uh, when it comes to uh, overall uh, Web2, Web3 development. I have... Uh, you know, four core things which I think are the most sensitive topic when it comes to the free infrastructure. Uh, it's DDoS attack, man in the middle, uh, I, and IP logging and, bridge and, and like privacy breaches. Uh, so maybe you can overview on what Chainstack does uh, to prevent, and maybe we can have a discussion what are the best practices and the tools uh, which we can very quickly bring from Web 2 to Web 3 because we are also... Mm, the way our blockchain is designed is gasless nature. Uh, so we do have to do quite a lot of uh, protection layers so we don't get spammed and uh, overall not, not ever avoid ever malicious activities. Uh, so can you just overview the chain stack, uh, security stack, security principles, um, and what, what you would recommend uh, for every company, at least like the basic 
uh, basic things, what they do need to secure their own infrastructure and products as well. Yeah, regarding security, uh, I would uh, rather start uh, from the point when we uh, like we we could uh, think uh, uh, if it is uh, secure secure to use a, a third party provider to access uh, your uh, blockchain data or your nodes, uh, is it secure um, at all? Um, and uh, just to you clarify, um, when you are using uh, your own node, uh, or you you are using uh, the uh, uh, Web three provider, or you are using uh, public endpoints, uh, the blockchain structure, the blockchain nature uh, uh, doesn't allow uh, to the. Uh, this man in the middle, for instance, uh, uh, for provider uh, to uh, do something with your accounts, uh, like to st steal your uh, funds uh, and so on. And even uh, when you are sending a transaction, uh, as I said before, uh, it's uh, getting into the mempool, which is actually shared. And uh, this transaction actually has to be uh, on um, a lot of nodes at the same time to get in, into the blockchain to be executed uh, faster. So there is uh, nothing uh, specific uh, related to the um, security on the blockchain level, uh, like because you're still signing your transactions uh, on your site, uh, on your software, which is not uh, uh, controlled somehow by the node providers. And uh, if even if uh, the node provider has um, like doing some, uh, I'm just uh, um, trying to uh, Im imagine if, if he, the node tra provider would like to somehow to change the transaction, it's just impossible because of the nature of the blockchain. If the transaction has to be signed by the owner of uh, uh, the smart contract or, for, or the account. So th there is uh, no particular uh, security uh, issues uh, that could uh, occur when you are using uh, the node provider uh, versus uh, your self-hosted node or public public endpoint. I don't I don't fully agree on uh, because I know actually you have like a HTTPS. Uh, I, I think you're using Cloudflare as a as a as a uh, DNS layer, uh, if I'm correctly. So uh, that is okay. Uh, like you can add additional layers of security like MTLS and et cetera, but that's actually not necessary when you have the private infrastructure, which is usually used for backend. Though on the other hand that people are like, so because I don't want to be a little bit misleading, then people are using the uh, public RPC nodes. It's actually, they should check, always check if it's HTTPS protected and always consider not using your wallets, especially when you are connected to public Wi-Fi. Uh, there are a couple of reasons to this because when you are using the public fi Wi-Fi, you're vulnerable to uh, breaches. So let's say even if your transaction data, uh, if it's sent for the RPC, even your um, uh, your transaction data, if it's selling encoded, it still consists couple of uh, parameters like your wallet address and other or, and couple of other things, which actually uh, creates in a way a privacy breach. Because if you can uh, detect who are using the uh, public network and a public wallet, and you can literally map the user with uh, with his assets allocations. And actually, recently in the last few years, there were quite a few cases when people literally get abused. Um, probably most of these cases were not through the public Wi-Fi, etc. But we were just bragging about how much crypto we have. Uh, so people need to be really careful when they are uh, exposing their allocations and exposing their um, and exposing, um, you know, their assets, holdings, etc., publicly because, uh, you know, there are crazy people around who who can do a lot to uh, literally get uh, get money or exploit you. So this is just this. This is of course this is very. Um, this is very rare situation. Like it's it's really low probability that something like that could happen. Uh, but there are very few cases this year. So few cases already more than zero. And overall, just using a public Wi-Fi, you always need to be super careful. I'm never using public Wi-Fi anywhere myself. Uh, I would rather spend money on rooming, even if I'm in another country, uh, you know, than, 
then expose myself to vulnerabilities because you know hackers always uh, improve uh, and uh, they find the new ways to get around. So we are kind of not aware what's the latest in the market. Plus, especially in the last year, like I'm following Reddit groups and literally every day there is a new hack. And a lot of people, there is not, um, not for all the hacks, we know how it happens. So a lot of people are still using uh, wallets like MetaMask, which definitely made a lot of um, a lot of good for the web free and for decentralization. Uh, and definitely they are improving their security and like user experience, etc. But due to some of the um, uh, due to some of some of the ways which it is built, because it's still open source, code is public. It's Open source is always increases a bit more vulnerability, even though more developers can fix them, can fix it. But though there can be, you know, unknown gaps in their security, uh, which eventually leads to many. I think this year over six hundred million got stolen or something like that already, and it's year like we are still in the first quarter. So people have to be like super careful when using public or private <laughs> nodes. <laughs> I just wanted to add this to, to emphasize the necessity of take care of your own security uh, and definitely like adding to a face, having or having ha hardware wallets, uh, splitting your assets, not connecting your cold wallets to the websites. Uh, you know, like always just having that wallet as much as you're planning to use. Uh, always give, always check how much allowance you give and, and these sort of things. Yeah, as you said, uh, uh, these um, type of uh, hacks or uh, like potential threats, uh, uh, they are um, for us. Uh, it, why I was so, so uh, the, my answer was uh, so simple. Um, for us, uh, they are um, on the different, on the separate layer. Um, when you are a um, user of crypto, you, uh, I, I'm not sure I can count all the uh, opportunities to lose money um, because, uh, yes, you, as you said, uh, anybody just can uh, look at your uh, monitoring cafe and see that you have, uh, I don't know, a million dollars uh, in crypto and then uh, they just uh, uh, like uh, they make you to send uh, the money to the other address uh, having, I don't know, uh, a gun. Uh, and uh, there is a actual threat. Uh, it's uh, like and uh, people got killed uh, for money and uh, like I, 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 when we saw it in the, in the news, uh, but yes, for for us, it's kind of the different level, and it's uh, it's uh, rather on the level of the developers of the Web three application from one hand, because uh, the smart contract and its logic and the nature of the blockchain allows uh, um, like allows much more uh, potential um, uh, ways uh, how. Things can go wrong. For instance, uh, uh, the developers uh, think that uh, uh, there is a strong um, uh, order of the operations how that how it should be, but uh, like uh, there is a, a particular scammer uh, or hacker who would like to um, uh, to to make this uh, um, system work so wrong, and they can create a specific environment where this uh, system will go like crazy uh, like as you mentioned uh, before with this uh, case on sushi swap uh, just the customer like the user do uh, the thing that uh, they expect that will go the way they expect uh, but uh, actually the conditions are changing uh, they are evolving right uh, at the same moment you are sending your transaction because you think these are the prices, but before the transaction has will be executed, the change uh, will um, will come, and uh, you cannot uh, expect the same thing that uh, you saw just before. And uh, but uh, it is uh, more or less on the level of uh, uh, like trading or 
uh, using some new applications and so on. Uh, and uh, I just um, got used to uh, think about it on the lower level. Like uh, you have the transaction, you signed it, you send it to the uh, node and it will be executed uh now or then like anyways and nobody can like what what we can do what you can uh expect that this transaction will not uh, get into the network because uh like uh, the uh, uh there will be another transaction before for instance if you signed it like and send it uh, and so on like uh but uh, this is uh, kind of, it's not something that insecure. It's just uh, normal blockchain operations. And uh, there is no this type of security risks, but there is uh, like way more risks uh, in the, uh, on the level of smart contracts uh, or in social engineering. Uh, there, there is a lot. It's a super insecure to use script uh, at all. <laughs> I think we can uh, wrap this part. And uh, I think we can jump to IPFS and uh, quickly overview. And I have a couple of questions for you in the end. Uh, So for our listeners, uh, IPFS is a peer-to-peer protocol uh, which allows distribute files in a decentralized way. Uh, So it's a bit similar to the blockchain from ideology-wise because you can distribute your files across the system and have uh, different uh, servers communicating to uh, make those files decentralized, stored in a decentralized way. And uh, for those who uh, watch Silicon Valley, so it's kind of, I think, the combination of the blockchain and of the IPFS, it's kind of similar to what was talked in 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 a Silicon Valley. And IPFS is definitely right now facilitated uh, quite a lot for NFTs uh, and uh, to ensure that these files submitted to um, as IPFS JSONs, because uh, I know, I'm not sure actually if a lot of uh, listeners know, but when you mint NFT, uh, actually NFT itself doesn't store metadata. You can do it the way it's stored in a blockchain, but the usual standard for ERC721 tokens is actually store the reference in a musician, in a music, they are storing a bit different wise, uh, files. Uh, so IPFS comes really handy. And I know that Chainstack is also providing IPFS services uh, and accessibility to IPFS. So what has been a Chainstack's journey? How many clients you have? Is it growing? Because what I see, a lot of games and a lot of companies still keeps files in a normal storages because updating IPFS files, it's uh, problematic and uh, not actually possible. Uh, So do you have a lot of demand for this service? And uh, do do you consult clients based on this? And overall, what's your approach to IPFS? Um, Yeah, to start from the beginning, uh, the uh uh, IPFS, uh, uh, like uh, you said, the uh, uh, true thing that uh, the uh, uh, NFT uh, interest and uh, uh, when like it, it was, I guess, uh, two years ago or like that, uh, uh, when OpenSea uh, has a lot of attention uh, for the, I guess, for the first time, uh, and everybody uh, was minting to like this or that collection, uh, trading and so on. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, the uh, uh, you, you said that uh, it is a part of the standard uh, to have uh, IPFS, um, to have um, the metadata on the IPFS. I'm not sure actually if it is a part of the standard because uh, we were... Um, we have done a lot of work related to the analyzing on NFTs on different, uh, uh, minted on different platforms, uh, including OpenSea or uh, like some other platforms. And as I remember, there is a kind of 
uh, the zoo with the different approach uh, how to store this or that metadata. And uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, CryptoPunks, uh, it's not actually a standard uh, related to ERC721. You can't uh, match it. So when you uh, create <laughs> trying to create an NFT API, uh, which allows user to access uh, to any uh, collection you face with that there is no standard at all there uh, everybody's doing their own thing their own idea and uh, particularly uh, with um, the IPFS uh, in, uh, in regards uh, to IPFS uh, uh, first of all we saw um, a lot of uh, uh, NFT collections when the uh, developer of the collection for some reason, come up with uh, the hosting uh, of their uh, metadata and um, um, images or something else on their uh, storage uh, S3 or I, I don't remember what is it, AWS and so on. So finally, yes, you uh, go to the smart contract uh, ERC721 or this particular collection, you do the calls to get the information and uh, you see that URL is AWS something URL then this uh, uh, developer of this collection uh, just stop using this AWS uh, account or drops or stop paying for it and then you have broken link and this NFT mm, just points to something that doesn't exist. And uh, this is a clear problem why people started using IPFS uh, exactly to avoid this type of situation because uh, with IPFS, uh, what they store, uh, the collection items store the link to IPFS uh, CID, uh, which is actually the, uh, like uh, in, in simple words, is uh, some type, of hash of the particular file. So if the file is uh, the uh, combination of bytes, then the IPFS hash, IPFS address, is uh, actually the uh, kind of hash of this file. So if you change the file, the IPFS, uh, the hash of the file will be changed. And also in the, the other way around, if you have the IPFS hash, uh, you can definitely check that the file is the same. And in this, in this case, uh, this file can be stored uh, like anywhere. But again, if uh, the file has been uh, lost, uh, there is no file. You know this IPFS hash, but there is no file still. Uh, and uh, uh, IPFS uh, is built uh, in the way that it's uh, actually uh, point to the file. It can, um, like, it, it stores uh, this uh, um, metadata but uh, you still uh, don't like you have to um, either pin uh, the uh, file to your IPFS node because nobody is incentivized to store the file itself uh, and uh, uh, the file even the metadata the, this link and um, uh, like uh, there is a technology uh, related to like which can solve this problem, but actually there is no actual solution because you have to run a PFS node, you have to run uh, some storage, you have to uh, connect them in the right way, uh, then you mint NFT, then what? Should you keep this node or if you sent or if, if you uh, sold all the NFTs, should you keep this note with uh, all this data? You, like that, it's, it's hard. It's uh, like weird. It's unnecessary overhead, basically. And uh, assuming that uh, there were, there were a lot of uh, uh, developers who would like to mint their own collections and there is no actual uh, tool to do this uh, in a convenient way in this part like you have to face with uh, this IPFS stuff and uh, there is no ready to use the service and um, um, uh, but uh, uh, these services in different um, types uh, they appeared so uh, some of them had no API like for instance Mm, I don't remember actually. So you you open the service. Uh, there is a user interface, and you create a bucket, 
uh, you like you create a link, uh, you put here the file, like uh, I don't remember. And uh, now also there were services who which has API, so you can uh, go over the list of uh, uh, NFTs in your collection in writing your code. Call this API, create uh, this uh, um, uh, link, uh, put there the file, and that's it. And it's much more convenient. And we actually did uh, pretty the same thing. And uh, uh, so we have uh, just an ordinary, I guess, uh, IPFS uh, API with storage, storage based on StoreJ, which is also decentralized. Uh, um, layer for storage uh, and I would not say that uh, there is a lot of uh, demand right here in terms of uh, what we had uh, when there uh, everybody were minting and trading and so on uh, but uh, like in, in my uh, opinion it's just uh, mm, like it's a uh, inevitable uh, like part of the infra web3 infrastructure now or then like in the future uh, like as uh, we have the nodes because we need to communicate with the blockchain and while if we are building Web3, if we are building decentralized applications, we also will need all these components of the IT infrastructure but built in the decentralized way, which is storage like hosting, compute hosting, ENS for instance, domain name system and so on, like we can only imagine how it would uh, look like uh, in the future uh, how we will use it in the future uh, and we are trying we are building we are building this way that way and I guess uh, the time will like only uh, show how it will look like in the future can't deny anything <laughs> um, okay uh, so for the end I have a few questions because I don't think there is Nothing I, I would like to cover more about IPFS. You explained perfectly from the beginning to the end. Uh, you know, like it's 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 a it's a necessary tool to have if you are a blockchain infrastructure provider, especially RPCs, etc. Because it all comes, uh, you know, with a with with a one package. Basically, you definitely need if you're building NFT solution. Uh, I think it will uh, the demand of IPFS will grow. Uh, because I think they are close to the stage where asset tokenization is coming. And when it comes to asset tokenization, where definitely we will, it will come as standardization of uh, NFTs because of the legislations and because of uh, cross interoperability and because all the necessities which needs to come together with uh, decentralization. Uh, to end, so for the listeners, if developers listen, we our content is quite long. Uh, if someone listened to the end, <laughs> so uh, what is, what are the chain stacks main competitive advantages? Like just go ahead right now. It's time for the pitch. I think we covered a lot of topics. Um, uh, so we are definitely uh, fans, and I think uh, together we are exploring quite a few interesting things like Sacro Labs and. Um, I think we're learning from each other quite quite a lot. So, but right now, for our listeners and for developers who are listening to this content, what are the chain stacks competitive advantage against um, our competitors? And because we ended up for you as being our one of the main, actually the main RPC provider, uh, just tell them. Share. Let's share with, with the audience. I guess. Uh, uh... Uh, chain stack we are always trying to uh, improve the uh, web3 infrastructure in the way that uh, the developers can develop easier and faster and uh, in that case uh, recently we released uh, uh, a pretty big update uh, which is called uh, gan archive uh, it's global elastic node with uh, all archival data together with full node data with debug and trace API and it's available in a uh, single endpoint so uh, when if you uh, ever if you try to use archival nodes you know that they're slow they're having headlock and if you use full nodes they're super fast but there is no access to archive data and there is always compromise and uh, we finally released this uh, uh, gen archive uh, node which uh, 
combines the speed of the full nodes and the archival data and the debug trace data. It's also globally available. So if your customer or your particular server is calling the API, it's always go to the uh, closest uh, node. And even if uh, the nodes uh, which are which tending to fail some sometimes, it every time will be redirected to the other node. And uh, the, this uh, kind of, uh, for us, I guess it's a big leap uh, to finally uh, get this ultimate uh, uh, endpoint, ultimate uh, node, which can do anything that we could do in the past, but in the uh, entirely in one single product. It's super convenient, super fast and reliable. I guess uh, that's the main thing. And... Uh, uh, currently, we have uh, a discount uh, which uh, allows users to get uh, the gross $49 plan just for $1. It's a great discount. You can try it right now. That's it. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much, Kirill. I'm really happy to have you as a trusted partner. Uh, like I really enjoy working together, collaborating, uh, sharing interesting ideas and sharing a really interesting conversations as well uh, together with you. So thank you, you, and thanks to our listeners. And I would like to say goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Goodbye.